What if I told you that your 3D printer was really only working in two and a half dimensions? Well, technically that's correct. And in this video, I'll teach you how to do true 3D printing. Firstly, this video is not clickbait. Although your 3D printer has movement for X, Y, and Z, three axes, it pretty much never uses them at the same time. Each layer is stacked on top of the last, with only X and Y movements used to form the geometry. In between layers, the Z axis moves up and the X and Y process continues. Yes, I know that Z hop lifts the Z up and down during each layer, but it's not really for the purposes of creating geometry. The only thing that's close to true 3D printing is when we use spiral or vase mode. 3D printing for the vast majority is planar, and that means it's done in flat planes stacked up on top of each other. In the CNC world, we would call this type of machining 2.5D. In 3D printing, it produces the layer lines and step surfaces we see in our final objects. To overcome this effect, what we need is called non-planar, where the printer is moving at the same time in X, Y, and Z to create a truly 3D toolpath as it extrudes plastic and creates geometry. In this guide, I'm going to showcase the excellent work of others, and if you follow along like me, you'll be able to experience true 3D printing. It's early days and there's still a lot of issues to overcome, but the future is exciting, so without any further delay, let's begin. There's a good chance you've seen this video doing the rounds, because it definitely went viral. It features an Ultimaker 2 printing in three dimensions. Check out the 3D perimeter around the outside of this shape, and then it matches it with 3D infill on top. Like most people, I was really impressed with the results and I thought I'd definitely have to give this a try. Some prints just aren't suited to 3D printing, but this technique looked like it could overcome that. I googled non-planar 3D printing and I found this Hackaday article from 2016. It was explained in a lot of detail with lots of technical terms and diagrams. I figured since it was created before the most recent viral video, I'd give this one a go first. I followed the link to their GitHub and I noticed the script at the top that does the actual post processing. I then followed all of the instructions from the GitHub, installing Strawberry Pearl on my Windows machine and configuring my installation of Slicer. I did actually get the script working and I was able to drag the resultant G code into Simplify 3D to preview it. It was pretty interesting too because it had non planar layers the whole way through. You can see across the side of the wing that actually bent and really compressed at the nose and tail. I stopped testing at this point simply because I wasn't smart enough to understand all of the parameters and how I might tweak them to progress. Back to the original video then. In the description of that video we had a link to a page with more details. The video is embedded with a large before and after image. It's here that we learn this work was conducted as part of a master thesis at the University of Hamburg. This document is linked and is very very detailed. It's clear that an immense amount of work has gone into this and for them to make the results public, I'm very thankful. There's a huge amount of calculation involved, but as we can see in the evaluation section, the final results are pretty special. I was sold, so I headed over to the GitHub to discover that instead of being a plugin, this was a whole custom version of Slicer. The instructions were pretty short to compile it, but it was only for a Linux machine. I headed back to the original video and to my despair saw in the comments that the original author was unable to compile it for Windows. I went to the main Slicer documentation and saw a link for building on Windows. This page however was stupidly long and detailed, but I figured I didn't really need to understand what I was doing, I just needed to be able to follow the steps. Which steps to choose however was difficult, there was about 4 or 5 different versions on how to do it on this page. There was also a lot of links to other pages where we had to compile dependencies too. I jumped headfirst down the rabbit hole on the Windows command line, copying and pasting the commands from the instructions. I got part of the way through, but eventually I ran into errors and I just wasn't skilled or knowledgeable enough to be able to troubleshoot them. I remembered that I had a Linux computer in the Raspberry Pis I used to run Octoprint. I connected via SSH and PuTTY and started to follow the instructions again, except it was stupidly slow. A Raspberry Pi is not really intended for this type of heavy lifting and it wasn't long until I ran into errors, therefore I needed a dedicated Linux machine. From here on in is my process to get this thing working and it starts with setting up a virtual machine. That means I ran up an emulated Linux computer inside my Windows 10 environment. I'd done this in the past but needed a refresher, so I followed this guide that gave me a step by step on the settings needed in the software to set this up. 
it's linked in the description for you to follow as well. One nice thing is that this is completely free. The VirtualBox software that we use is free as well as the Linux operating system and I chose to use Ubuntu. Once the VirtualBox was running, I opened up the GitHub inside Firefox which is inbuilt and then pasted the commands into the terminal one at a time. The good news is everything here worked 100% as it should have. No errors and after not too long, I was able to successfully compile the version of Slicer that I needed. Here we see the moment where I enter the last command and the Slicer GUI opens up ready to use. As you can see, until you tweak things, the window that you're working through is tiny, pretty much unusable. So I closed up Slicer and navigated to the Devices menu of VirtualBox and inserted the Guest Edition CD. This will auto run and you simply keep clicking forward until the scripts are installed. When it reboots, all of a sudden you'll find that the interface is a lot bigger and now all of a sudden it's quite usable. The next problem is getting files in and out of the virtual machine. I found this great video tutorial on YouTube, which I followed step by step to set up a shared folder that could be accessed in Ubuntu as well as my Windows host machine. This video, like all the other guides I'm showing, is linked in the description. After one more restart, I was able to create a folder and as you can see, all of the files are accessible on both Ubuntu Virtual Machine and the Windows 10 host. After slicing, I could now whack them on an SD card to print from my Windows machine. And that brings us to the next problem that needed solving and that was picking a printer with sufficient clearance. The majority of 3D printers these days have nozzles that don't extend very far past the shrouds and this was true for all of the printers at my house. In the rare cases that the nozzle did protrude, there was a probe nearby a found shroud, or in the worst cases, both. My Ender 3 was the only printer that I had that was suitable for this, and that's because I'd modified the hot end to have the Hero Me fan duct, which is modular. Disassembling was really straightforward. The part cooling fan simply pulls out, and I'd already wired in a DuPont connector, so I unplugged that to release the fan completely. Next, the fan duct is held in place with an M3 bolt on each side. I simply took my Allen key and loosened both of those, before simply sliding it down the bottom and out of the way, exposing the nozzle for the process that we need. Next, to remove the BL touch, the probe of which was far too low. Two bolts to undo that, unplug it, and all of a sudden we have the required clearance we need, the final step being, of course, to reflash the firmware back to standard. As per the original video, I took measurements of 8mm clearance with an angle of 45 degrees. Back in Slicer, we now need to configure it for our printer. We can hit the cog next to the three options and then go through copying and pasting our settings from our existing slicer into this copy. I used slicer for many years back in the day so I found it quite familiar but if you are switching from something else you should find that most of the parameter names match up or at least can be discerned with a bit of common sense. One of the most important things to set up is the size of your printer under printer settings. Getting this one correct will ensure that the object matches in real life what you're seeing in the preview on the printer bed. Now we're up to the actual settings for non-planar printing. We need to tick the box, enter our angle, and our height from the tip of the nozzle to the next chunkiest part. After this, save a preset with non-planar in the name so you don't get confused. In Slicer, we can click Add to add our STL to the plate. After this, we click on Preview to automatically slice the object and see the resultant G-code. At first, the output of the slicer was not generating any non-planar G-code and I was quite confused. And if you've got this problem, you can switch back to the terminal where you started the script and you'll have any error messages. We can see here I have a combination of areas being too small or collisions being detected. I didn't really get consistent results until I tweaked my settings. I found it was necessary to increase the angle from 45 to 50 degrees and after I saved and re-sliced, everything started to work as expected. Performance inside the emulated environment is not as good as a native computer, but it'll get the job done. Like most slicing software, we can preview the G-code, and we have a slider on the side to go through layer by layer. We can see that for the majority of this object, it builds it up with completely standard processes until it reaches the end, in which case it starts layering non-planar layers on top to build up to the final height. If we're happy with our G-code, we simply click on Export G-code, and I save it to my shared folder so I can access it again back in Windows. The first print I tried was the error foil that you just saw. After I saw that the first layer was going down correctly, I headed off to bed. 
Now there was a lot of hurdles to jump for me, but if I had the benefit of hindsight and stuck with the method that did actually work, I could probably get this whole thing set up in around about an hour. I guess it's a good time to look at my results and in my opinion, they're very encouraging. As you saw earlier, the first test print I did was an error foil. And from the moment I saw the finished result, I was hooked. You only need to see it next to another error foil printed using planar traditional slicing to see the tremendous improvement in surface quality. Now last week at school, I was helping a student 3D print a component from the major design project and it had very shallow tops. I therefore imported the STL and did a back-to-back -back comparison. The main problem here was that without a part cooling fan, the archway in the middle of the part looked pretty terrible. The final result is pretty interesting, but probably not the best demonstration of this technique. Next up, wanting to recreate some of the surfaces seen in the original video, I jumped onto CAD and made up some special shapes. They started life as a simple rectangular prism and a simplified version of my TT logo cut from the middle. I then applied additional cuts from the sides, giving the top shallow curving surfaces. This, like the others, was very mesmerizing watching the extruder create the solid infill on top. This first one has a single continuous convex top and in my opinion, the results are definitely more pleasing. Next up, I upped the complexity of my cut, making it like a very shallow wave. I think this one also looks good, but the real benefits were seen in my third test piece. For this shape here, I did back-to-back -back testing and I decided to cut the shape from one side and then from a second 90 degrees to the first. What that gives is a lot more complex geometry on top, even though I've smoothed it all out with some fillets. The difference in before and after here is massive, with the non-planar version just looking so much more aesthetically pleasing. Finally, I wanted to make a shape similar to that seen in the demo video, so I did another before and after of this new one. This was the most complex geometry on top that I tried, and in my opinion, it gave the best results. The non-planar part looks so much better than the original without any of the staircase effect that we traditionally see with 3D printing. If you want to have a go at printing this one yourself, without going to the hassle of setting up the special slicer, I'm going to link the G-code down below, but be warned, you will need to modify your hot end just like I did to avoid collisions. So I'm really impressed by my testing results here, but don't expect this to be rolled out into your favorite slicer anytime soon. And that's because there's a number of issues. Firstly, 3D printers aren't currently designed to handle this type of technique. We would need to have a big shift in 3D printer design philosophy, with manufacturers aiming to have much pointier nozzles and have them extending far below fan shrouds and probes for auto bed leveling. Secondly, we would need a lot more testing on the slicing side. It's clear from the link thesis that a hell of a lot of research went into this, and it's not going to be easy for other slicers to roll out this type of implementation. Furthermore, compared to the parameters that we usually tweak in our slicing software, if you put in incorrect inputs for both the nozzle angle and clearance height, it's going to have catastrophic results as everything collides and causes potential damage. Another limitation is that with current 3D printers, the nozzle is designed to extrude sideways across a flat layer. But in this instance, we have slopes, and therefore on the low side, it's not going to quite meet properly, and this can only really be fixed by being able to tilt the print head over from side to side like you'd have on a five axis CNC machine. All of that aside, it does seem that this is the future, especially when you look at all the positive comments left on the original video. I'm certainly very appreciative of the work of the original author and have enjoyed following through and testing out something new. Hopefully this video gives you the steps to be able to pursue that as well. And please let me know in the comments if you do so, because I'd love to see your results. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy true 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.